the number one spend that it takes to grow your business is marketing spend. And that can come in the form of, of, you know, is it spending on marketing or people that one carries kind of a late can carry a labor component Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. The other one is pre spending on capacity, which in generally is, is labor that's Mm -hmm. not fully utilized to then fill it up and sell into it. Now in the scaling process, it, you know, so the the black hole that I talked about in the first book of between mm-hmm. a million and five million in revenue yeah. is painfully real, and three million dollars of revenue is the deepest darkest moment of the black hole, and and the reason for that is is it's where the next person or the next catalytic spin that you have to put out is far more significant to your overall financial picture than it is when it's $5 million or $10 million or $20 million. Mm -hmm. And so you got to get through that period before the catalytic steps that you take aren't so critical between an edge of life and death. Today, we're talking with Greg Crabtree. He's the author of the book, Simple Numbers, and he recently published Simple Numbers 2.0, Rules for Smart Scaling. He founded his own firm to focus on helping entrepreneurs to build their economic engine. And he recently merged with a top 20 accounting firm in the US to help to broaden their impact on the entrepreneur community. Today, we'll be talking about his rules for smart scaling and how to scale smartly and profitably. And just quickly, before we get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. And let's get into it. Welcome, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to speak to your folks. Yeah, and um, like I purchased your first book, uh, Simple Numbers, uh, straight after I interviewed Vern Harnish, and he talked about it. And it was, yeah. it was such a simple way to think about scaling up a company, right? And obviously, yeah. then I bought your second book, Smart Scaling, um, which is um, the follow-up to that book. And I really appreciate how you've taken complex accounting speak and converted it into what people in business can actually understand, you know? So where did you get the idea for this uh, book? Really, it came from the fact that, you know, I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization in 2001, which is not common for accountants. There's more accountants in it now. But when I joined, I, I mean, I was, I was like one of a handful of accountants in the world, you know, that were members. And, and in my forum, you know, I was doing a presentation about what we did. And, and I just happened to ask, you know, my other nine forum mates who I couldn't do business with. So I was kind of in a safe space. And, and I said, how many of you would recommend your current accountant? And the answer was zero. It's like they didn't hate them, but they didn't like them. Mm. And, and they might have liked them as a person, which made it kind of this uncomfortable relationship because, well, it's like I kind of need them, but I, I don't, you know, I really wish they could do this, but they say they can't. Mm. And, and I said, okay, well, what, you know, so I dug deeper. I said, well, what is it that you need that you're not getting? And it really launched our practice into what we do today is we flip the script of saying, you know, the most important thing I can do to help a business is to help them run a profitable, fully capitalized, wealth building, cash flow producing business mm. that it's, it's a good thing to sell it. And it's a good thing to keep it. You know, there's no, there's no bad idea. And, and, and whereas most of my profession who had tried to get into consulting, they did it as an add on, of oh, when I'm not busy doing taxes, when I'm not busy doing audits, then we'll, we'll try to do some consulting, but no, mm. nobody could define what that was. Mm. And I said, okay, well, well, tell me then, you know, what is it that you want to know? And they said, well, the first thing is, is we don't like the tax day surprise, so it doesn't matter where you're at in the world. You got to deal with taxes for the most part, <laughs> mm-hmm. unless you're in just an, even if you're in a no tax country, it, but if you do business in a taxable country, you got to deal with taxes. Yeah. So taxes, it, it's, it's the surest thing is death. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, well, let, let's deal with that, but let's predict it. Have you set the money aside irregardless of when the taxing authority tells you to send it in? So that it's not a surprise because it's mm. not your money and mm. it's not going to be your money. Yeah. And, 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 and that led to a few other things about intellectual honesty about taxes of, 
when are you truly saving taxes versus when are you just postponing it to a different period? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of bad discussion around that concept of, I always try to be clear, you know, when we tell somebody, well, I helped you save taxes permanently in this idea, this one, Hey, we just moved it from this year to next year. And I can't guarantee that the rate's going to be the same. So Mm -hmm. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, I got that. I said, "I, I understand that. And I think I've got some ideas already that I can fix that piece, you know, just require some communication and process. Good. What's next? It says, well, we don't like being billed by the hour. And this became, and a lot of people who are going to listen to this podcast do business this way and that they bill by the hour. I got news for you. This is going to shock you, but if you bill by the hour, there's only two possible outcomes. I either gave away my expertise or I charged for my ignorance. You never get to an economic equilibrium. And it, it's essentially a lazy way of doing business because you don't pre-plan enough to scope what really needs to be done. And two, you're not confident in crafting your offering to charge a market price to then make the, the cost fit. And, and, and really, we've proven this over and over again with our clients to get them off of an hourly billing mindset wherever possible to say, what will the customer pay for this? We see this in the contracting business that does cost mm-hmm. estimating and job estimates all the time. And they fall into the other trap is that they do this cost buildup, add a little profit, and they say, oh, well, this is what we got to charge. And I go, no, no. You start with what is the customer willing to pay? Now, let's see what is the least amount of cost it's going to take to do it and how much profit can we make? And, and, it's, and, and this is really what I would say is my passion that I've, I've come to learn, but I didn't, I didn't know it existed as a formal course of study is behavioral economics. I mean, I, I would say probably I've become a, a, a practical practitioner <laughs> of behavioral economics to yeah. understand how humans interface with economic issues and questions. And, and I want to stay away from manipulation, but, but I do like to help everybody get to optimization, you know, of understanding those things. And so, so that hourly billing thing was just one of the big ones. And, yeah. and so today, everything we do on a consulting basis is all fixed price. And then the last piece, I said, okay, well, what else? This is, oh, well, oh, by the way, you see hundreds of businesses, most intimate details. You ought to have some idea what works and what doesn't. And to me, this was what just hit me right between the eyes. As a profession, we constantly do this. Now, we, we don't. We really have made a study of looking at the data and saying, what is all of this data telling us? And, and now it's a little more common for people mm-hmm. to think that way because of big data and all those things. Mm-hmm. But essentially, study the data, study trends. I can't share, obviously, intellectual property or, mm-hmm. or trade secrets or those things. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I can certainly study the data to see trends. One of the things we do today, which has become hugely beneficial to our clients, we, we monitor a hundred company model. So um, one of the things that doesn't exist anywhere in the world is um, economic, real-time economic data on privately held businesses. Mm. What actually is happening? Every government is hamstrung because they know nothing about your business at the moment. Mm. Literally nothing. And, and so when you talk to the economists at the, the central banks, you don't want to know how they come up with the data, I'm telling you, because yeah, <laughs> no, it's, no. it's, a, it's a little bit manufactured. Mm. And so we said, you know, this is a problem. I want to know. And, and so, OK, well, since our practice, we have clients all over the U.S. and Canada, mm. mm-hmm. we have several clients in Australia. Um, so we get snippets, but we, we said, okay, well, let's focus on the U S at this point and let's see if we can come up with our own index. Mm. And so this is our simple, simple numbers company model. It's a billion dollars of revenue. So I say, that's a pretty good data set. It's mm-hmm. kind of hundred companies. Uh, we didn't just pick the winners and losers. We said, Hey, here, here's the first hundred companies we can come up with. We have, we have data for this, at least a minimum three-year range of time. Mm-hmm. And we monitor it every month. And I, I'm telling you, the learning has just been off the chart fascinating because, you know, what the economy is doing versus what the media and the government says it's doing are just diametrically opposed. You know, last year, you know, so obviously, especially during COVID, this was extremely fascinating to watch is, you know, certainly we fell off the cliff. We were running that 100 companies was running about an 8% growth rate coming mm-hmm. into COVID year over year. Mm-hmm coming off of six years of double digit growth rates 
by, mind you. So we the, the the private company economy had been growing at a massive rate, mm-hmm. you know, bigger than what anybody was reporting GDP was at. And and so, but it has sort of slowed down because we ran out of labor. I mean, literally in the U.S., we were just out of people. And so, COVID hits and there's a shake up, and you know, and you, you see a 25 percent decline in April. You see about a a, a 20 percent decline in May, and then boom, June comes back a little bit as things try to reopen settle back down and and by the end of the year we actually ended up in 2020 up six percent now if you ask people what they thought happened in 2020 that would not be the answer Mm. and you know and these are the kind of things now the other thing is like we see trends like we, we specifically focus on things like marketing and we have marketing clients that we communicate with but we also are big fans of effective marketing and yep. you know what's the right number to spend and how do you leverage mm-hmm. and scale your business with effective marketing spend. But it's it's fascinating to see that the marketing spend for these hundred companies have still not gotten back to the pre-COVID levels. So that's telling you that the market does not believe that there's open and willing customers in certain segments that are willing to buy yet. And so they're they're holding back on that cash and it's going to release it. Um, so these are the kind of things that you know that my forum taught me to say, listen, you know, I mean, nobody's paying me directly to go look at that model, but it's incredibly valuable insight that we can then share across our client base mm-hmm. and, and our community, you know, and really give them some, some tangible answers that other people are just kind of making it up. And uh, at least there's, there's some, some indication you, you can accept that it's not a big enough model. Okay. I get that, but I, I think it is. Uh, I think it's, it's been, pretty good. Yeah, like yeah. I've the two books which are highly recommended. Everyone that is listening on the podcast right now, highly recommended to really simplify the thinking behind. I guess operating the business. That's the first book, um, profitably, yeah. and then the second book is scaling smartly. But let's just jump straight yeah. into scaling smartly. Yeah. But what yeah, do you mean cool. by scaling smartly? So it's you know this is this is this discussion that we have with entrepreneurs, and you know I I, I mean it almost comes up every day and. You know, had a client on the call earlier this morning that said, you know, they had some extra money. He says, what do I need to spend it on? I said, well, I mean, you don't you don't need any cash. I mean, he said, your business is producing enough free cash flow that everything that they needed to grow their business with is an expense, but it's a finite number that would not drive them to a loss. So you just need to decide you know, what is the catalytic spend that, that is going to scale your business? Now, what we've learned from studying the growth path of all of our clients is this. The number one spend that it takes to grow your business is marketing spend. And that can come in the form of, of you know, is it spending on marketing or people? That one carries kind of a la- can carry a labor component mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. The other one is pre-spending on capacity, which in generally is, is labor that's mm-hmm. not fully utilized to then fill it up and sell into it. Now, in the scaling process, it, you know, so the, the black hole that I talked about in the first book of between mm-hmm. a million and five million in revenue yeah. is painfully real. And three million dollars of revenue is the deepest, darkest moment of the black hole. And, and the reason for that is, is it's where the next person or the next catalytic spin that you have to put out is far more significant to your overall financial picture than it is when it's $5 million or $10 million or $20 million. Mm -hmm. And so you got to get through that period before the catalytic steps that you take aren't so critical between an edge of life and death, you know, of the business and, and where you can't afford to miss Whereas I can afford to miss if I'm at 10 million and I try the next test of something Mm -hmm. in that process. But then what it really came down to is 90 plus percent of the things that we spend money on to grow are an expense. It's not a capital asset. It's not a piece of equipment. It's not a building. It's not a plant or a factory, you know, Mm -hmm. those kind of things. I mean, they can be. But even if you do those things, there's a way to look at it from a practical standpoint of, you know, framing the return on investment of my 
of my choice to spend because I want the, the, the thing that struck us was it kind of goes back to what we say. The, there's four types of capital. Three of them exist on your balance sheet. One of them hides on your P and L. And I think to me, that's kind of d- discovering, you know, the, you know, the, the ninth planet of the universe in a sense, it was sitting there in plain sight. We just didn't have a, a telescope strong enough to see it. Okay. Well, the reason why is, we had our mindset saying capital means balance sheet. No, it doesn't. I'm producing profit on my PL and then making choices to redistribute that profit into something that I didn't need to spend on to create what I'm currently doing. Every person that runs a business listening to this podcast, I want them to stop and think for a moment. What did you spend to try to grow the business in the last 12 months that ha- that wasn't needed? to be spent to produce what you did in the last 12 months. You mm. spin it to get to someplace else next. Mm. That's not a current operating cost. Mm. It's an investment in the future. It just happens to be on your PL. And so what we've done is try to design techniques. And you'll see a couple of these examples, like we've got the launch cat. We, we, the, the term we named the baby is uh, the capital component on your PL is called launch capital. It's an expense that I use to launch an activity, whether it's a business in total, a segment, a, a, the next new customer, or whatever that. So the key is putting words to it to give people, you know, you know kind of like what we did with LER in the first book of labor efficiency ratio. We've named the baby. So there's two critical names that we really came up with in the new book, one of them being trade capital, which is that key component of that cash that just turns over AR inventory mm-hmm. minus AP, yeah. you know, that, that component, it's a slightly different derivation than, than working capital. But to me, it's the accurate way of looking at, Hey, this is the cash piece, this investment piece that as the business gets bigger, that number, that dollar amount is going to get bigger, but it's going to stay in relation to my revenue. I'm just going to jump and in this, quickly now because I'm just trying to yeah. clarify a few things, right? Because there's a yeah. lot of concepts that are being shared right now and you're <laughs> talking very quickly about them. Um, so I get, so to be clear, right? Scaling smartly is, and just to conf- like, I could be wrong again, right? But scaling smartly is how you invest your launch capital and separating launch capital from tr- trade capital. And just to confirm, yeah. trade capital is what you need to produce the thing which you're selling at the time, launch right. capital is how you are taking the profit and spending it for future performance, yeah. right? And so what companies it, often yeah. do is they combine the two. They just think everything's an operation yeah. and right. that's where the confusion is. So scaling it, it is, absolutely. is how you choose to mm. invest the launch capital versus the trade capital. Is that the best way to think yeah, about it? it? In essence, you're, you're sitting at the blackjack table you're on a good run and you're trying to say, well, this is the amount that I kind of need to hold on to, but here's the amount that I'm willing to bet. And I, and I like kind of getting the entrepreneur to think about launch capital is a bet. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, how many so people marketing, have hired- So then is effective marketing or marketing, is that launch capital or is that Absolutely. trade capital? So all sales and marketing is launch capital because you it don't is, need them to satisfy your current customers. Is that- yeah. And, and unless unless you're in a business that literally nobody's going to come to you without uh, you're, you're in a transactional business and if you don't market nobody comes through your door mm-hmm. well that you, you so to a certain degree and this is what we do with our like our online retail clients we consider direct marketing of social media pay per click those kind of things mm-hmm. that's actually a cost of goods sold in the way that we look at online models now. Marketing for branding, awareness, content, those things, that's launch mm-hmm. capital, you know, in, in those. Because you can get by without spending anything and it, 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 it won't optimize the business, but but you'll keep getting business from that, that other. Most of the rest of service businesses, people that have a brand, they're mm-hmm. known in the community. Um, you know, I've got an oil change client that literally whether they market or not, somebody's going to drive past their place, see it says oil change and they'll go in and get their oil change. Sure. So they, they you know, that, that, but if they want to drive new activity, find new customers that don't know about them, that's launch capital. So then if, so then if I am looking at my PL, right. And I've got a net profit, right. I actually don't 
have a true trade profit. This is a trade right. plus launch profit, right? And so mm-hmm. what would you recommend as an action for people to do to really get the true number of how much is the business required to spend to just operate with the existing yep. customer base and how much to spend on growth? Like, like how do they separate this so, out? So there's two techniques and, and we, we go through those in the launch capital chapter of the, of the 2.0 book. So we show one technique where you're intentionally making this decision and evaluating the results. So that's one where it's actually a client that allowed us to share their exact data. Mm -hmm. So it was a client that grew from 700,000 in revenue and in five years grew to 10 million. And the only catalyst was they increased their marketing spend each year. And then they evaluated the, the increase in net profit from that increase in marketing spend. So notice this is the difference. This is one of the weaknesses that That's you get a in the marketing arena. Right? It a, is. Because this is the difference of net profit based on marketing spend, not the actual total net profit. Is that right? Yeah, I yeah, I don't I don't I don't care how much your revenue went up because you had other ancillary costs that had to be added to support that additional revenue. Mm. So those are what we call reflection costs. You know that that they're they're an echo of the initial catalytic activity, mm-hmm. and and so what you're really trying to get to is is what what was my net gain, and I want to recover the cost of my investment plus fifty percent or more on top of that that original bet that I made, and in the example that we show in the book, it worked four out of the five years. One year they just got their money back. They kind of missed. They they put too much money in. And, and hit that point of the marketplace that says, you can spend all you want, but we're not moving anymore because of it. You've tapped out the effectiveness level of, of that marketing spend. So you're really, I think, like you talk about in the book, uh, return on invested capital. Is that right? Is this, right. Is this what we're talking about right now? Is this like well, this is, this invested is, this is a sub this, a- this is a right. subcomponent of that. And so there's an overarching return on invested capital that we now use. When I did the original book, I, I had an observation of profit levels and, and I made a statement in the first book and also I restated it in the chapter I wrote for Vern's book uh, at 5% profit, you're on life support, 10% you're good, 15% you're great, anything above 15%, take it while you can get it because the market will beat <laughs> you back. Mm. And, and that works for about 70% of the companies out there. But it was the 30% that I had to do some kind of excuse to say, why didn't that work? Because I had clients that had 3% profit that were nicely profitable, but, but it's like, why? Mm-hmm. And, and so I kept studying it. And uh, fortunately, you know, through my EO organization, they, they let me chair an executive ed program at, at Horton. So I always say it's kind of nice that they let a, let a kid from a chicken farm in Alabama <laughs> hang out with like real professors. And, and, and I had to give all the credit to David Wessels. He was the one that really turned me on to the idea. And I don't think he, even he really knew what I would do with it Mm. because he didn't have access to the data I had access to. Mm -hmm. So I've got access to private companies. All he has access to is a, is a college professor, even at one of the premier learning institutions, he only has public company data. I got news for everybody out there. There's a public company. It does things for different reasons than we do in the private real world. Mm. And and so that's why I I'm, I'm focused on the private business community Mm -hmm. because you do, you, you do some crazy stuff when it comes to public stock. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but financial concepts are what they are. And so yes. I said, okay, well, what is, I had to define, what do I think is the minimum standard of return on invested capital for private companies? And I established to me, 50% return is, is the minimum viable standard. Um, I've got a couple of clients below that number, but they can get to 50. I've not modeled a North American company yet that couldn't get to 50 uh, there's some that don't get there just because they're making bad choices and, and it is what it is. Um, just for the listeners that are not across the concept yet. So invested capital is mm. what? C- could you just clarify so, so the invested definition capital of invested is, capital? Yep. So let's, let's start with equity. And, and this was a, a point that Professor Wessels made that I thought was quite uh, clear. He, he said equity is a flawed calculation. And he's absolutely right. What you got to do is look at the equity of your business and make a couple of adjustments. Do you have the appropriate amount of cash? So I make a big deal about you need two months of operating expenses in cash. 
So if I'm operating at less than full capitalization, I got to take equity and plus it up for how much cash really should be in the business to meet our minimum capital standard. Mm -hmm. Secondly, then you start adjusting plus or minus. Do you have any assets that are on your business balance sheet that aren't necessary for the operation of the business? Fixed asset, a related party loan, uh, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Intangible assets, mm -hmm. which really aren't real. They were just a plug number to buy something. Mm -hmm. you know, so you take all of those things off. If you can't convert it to value for what it's stated, you take it off. Mm -hmm. Same thing on the liability side. Do you have debt that really is unrelated? You know, maybe I, I, I took on an investment round of mezzanine debt. Well, that was just an investor putting money in for me to take some money off the table. And that really didn't, didn't create any value. It's just mm -hmm. kind of there. So to me, I take that out of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at true operating liabilities and accrued expenses and, and, and operating debt, a lot yeah. of credit, term debt on hard assets, those kind mm -hmm. of things. Once I make those adjustments, that number is my invested capital of an of a existing operating business in, in that process. Once I get that clean invested capital number, then I look at my net income before taxes. Cause and and to make it universal globally, I want to stick to a number that's pre-tax. Cause I everybody's got different taxes. Sure. Yes. World. So let's take taxes out of the equation. Let's say it, whether I pay taxes on or not, what is the pre-tax return on this asset? And that's what you're looking for. And and I and that the changes explosion. frequently though, doesn't it? That changes like that sh well, it should change frequently well, depending on how you're spending your or how you're investing well, your capital well, or spending your money, right? <laughs> like well, it it does historically until people focus on it. And what's amazing is so this has kind of been a passion of mine, is mm. is I see people start a really good business that's building value. And then they get distracted. And I mean, just imagine an entrepreneur that's, you know, attention deficit. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> yeah. and, and we start chasing the shiny object. And, and mm -hmm. I kept looking for what can I, how can I present the incredible value of what this business is that's in front of them and get them excited about it as an investment. And that's why I make a big deal to separate Here's what you, here's the job that you get and the income that you get off of the thing that you do, but let's really nurture this business as an investment and stop doing business activity that just provides you a job and let's do business activity that is a phenomenal leverage to create value. And, and so, so Alex, if you, if, if you said, Hey, I got a hundred thousand dollars that I'm looking to invest. And I says, great. You know, you give me a hundred thousand dollars. What if I give you a 50% return? Is that a little better than what the bank or the, the <laughs> markets are doing? You know, at go, 2%, okay, sounds at 1 good. These yeah. Days too. <laughs> yeah. So you give me a hundred thousand dollars a year from now, I give you a hundred thousand dollars back plus 50,000. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you got to pay tax on that 50,000 because it is taxable. Mm -hmm. But depending on your tax jurisdiction, you know, you've got probably at least 130,000 to reinvest. Mm -hmm. Here, here's the, here's the, the dirty, honest truth. 50% returns the minimum. Most of our clients operate between 75 and 100%, some as much as 200% return. And, and this is really kind of the explosion of understanding, categorizing business operations in terms of understanding a business's return on investment potential. So I'll give you a great example. Probably mm -hmm. the best return on invested capital business model we work with is in the IT uh, managed service environment, so MSPs. And those guys, if they run their model correctly, so one, they've got monthly recurring revenue for the fixed services. Yes. They'll occasionally bill for uh, projects and activity of those existing customers. Yes. But if they do it correctly and get money up front so that they're not out of pocket any of that cash, they're one of the, the leanest capital structure businesses because all they need to operate from a capital perspective is their two months of operating cash. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of equipment. Most of them don't even have equipment. Everything's mm -hmm. is in the cloud or you yep. know least least kind of stuff. And so the average the 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 uh, we run a couple of mastermind groups for MSPs, and the 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 top twenty five percent of those companies in those mastermind groups have a two hundred percent in uh, return on invested capital. And that and so their only their only challenge is to grow. But is that calculation based on 
trade capital or is that trade plus launch capital? Is that combined? Well, see, the, so they, their trade capital is zero because they get paid in advance. Okay. So, so see, why, that's what so makes trade capital is a cash flow discussion. Is. is that right? Is exactly. Yeah. But I just to clarify, right? Because there's, yeah, there's, yeah, go ahead. there's uh, quite a lot of concepts here. But if you can change your cash flow strategy in terms of actually how you invoice your customers, your payment terms, mm-hmm. um, that shifts your speed of scaling or your speed of growth significantly. Is that right? Right. And right. why is because that? It, well, what you're doing is, like I said, you're you're one taking away a barrier to growth. Because when you start to quantify trade capital as a percentage of revenue, so traditional accounts receivable, maybe plus inventory with very little trade support, those businesses, 20% of revenue has to be sitting there in trade capital. Mm. And, and so, so in those cases, if, and, and we make a point of this, we call this the cash power ratio. Mm. If your trade capital percentage is at 20% and your profit percentage is at 10%, what it tells you is for every new dollar of revenue growth, I've got to put 10% of my money in just to get it started. If I can invert that and make trade capital 10% and profit 20%, I'm 10% positive cash on every new dollar of revenue. Which, which business do you think can grow faster? Yeah. A business that, grow, that creates positive cash with every new dollar of growth or a business that has to go – get bucketfuls of cash to keep throwing into the company. I've got this food distributor in Central America client that, I mean, it's just dreadful. I mean, you know, it takes them, you know, they have to pay for their, their inventory when they order it and they have to wait 60 days to get paid by who they sell to. Um, that's mm. a bad business model. So it's, it is for you. Yeah. It's so, so on the face of it, and I'm going to, to um to check in now is it correct me again Mm -hmm. if i'm wrong but on the face of it it seems that you can you can scale faster if you change your payment terms and so that for every new client that you get um it adds cash to your business instead of it kind of adds cost right is that the first yes yes but no Yes, but well, let but. me let me let me put it to you in a in a different sense. Yes. So so my good friend Alan Miltz, you know, he, he's he's probably I don't know if he's done your podcast, but you know, he's certainly known in in the same community. that mm-hmm. uh, works with both of us, and we both contributed to his book. And Alan, you know, talks about those components. And really, a lot of my thinking in 2.0 came from Alan and I do a lot of joint presentations together. And and the thing is, is Working on those individual components, the answer is yes. But here's the bigger issue. I've got to look. I I can't just focus on AR. I can't just focus on inventory. I can't just focus on accounts payable. I can't just focus on deferred revenue. I can't just focus on profit. And so that's why we put it in relation. I've got to look at trade capital as a net number because there's trade-offs in there. There's, mm. there's things that sit on the that asset side and things that sit on the, on the liability side that can net against each other. Okay. And so I want to give you more tools to say, listen, just look at the framework and say, if I'm at 20% trade capital and 10% profit, okay, what are my choices? Can I bring down my trade capital? I mean, that's obviously one of the things. But you may be in a market to where as hard as you try, mm. the answer is, nope, that's just the way it is. And I'll, I'll share an interesting story with you in a second about that, though, breaking through bad thinking. Mm-hmm. But so then what you have to do is, say, okay, well, let's shorten the gap. Let's get our profit up. Mm. So if, if, I'm, if I'm handed a, a trade capital in the 20% range, I just got to get profit up to 15, 17, 18 and narrow that gap. Mm. I will tell you that once people understand both data points and we're hammering them with it with every call every month and showing it to them, this is the power of data. They start to do things about it. They start to question the status quo. Mm. And, and I'll give you a good example. So yes, one, of our, one of our Australia clients is a staffing business. And so we, we have several staffing clients in the U.S. And one of the staffing businesses are notorious for bad trade capital. And so typically so by staffing business, 
Um, like a service business. Is that what you mean by staffing business? Yeah. So you're, you're going to them for either temp services and they may be specialized in an industry. They may be oh, general for, temp, for actual temp staff. Services. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is where it is. You're not, I mean, they might do some placement for mm-hmm. fee, but mm-hmm. it's mostly you're renting a body from them yeah. for a particular task. Mm-hmm. And so typically those companies have about eight to 10% profit and they, um, uh, they have about 20 to 25% trade capital just dreadful business. Mm. And, and, and so, you know, so I, I pick up this client in Australia and we start going through his numbers and I go, Hmm, well, he's about 15% profit. Well, that's good. You know? And I look at his balance sheet and it's like, it's a trade capital is a negative number. So here's, here's the thing that you want to know when your trade capital is negative, that means that you're holding your customer's money before you do anything. Mm-hmm. Now there's a, there's a bad side to that. You got to make sure that if you're holding your customer's money, that you don't spend it unwisely before you complete what it was that they gave it to you. But if you're disciplined and do it right, it's a wonderful place to be. Mm-hmm. Because in this guy's case, he had found a way to get his customers to pay him in advance. And I said, you know, I, I, I got, you know, these staffing clients in the U.S., I haven't seen this in ours. How did you get to a negative trade capital? And he, he said, well, we ask, really. You ask. Says, so, yeah, you know, I mean, the customers we were dealing with, they, they had the money. We convinced them we were going to do what we said we were going to do. And we just asked for the first month up front as deposit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of stays there, you know, throughout the, the length of the contract. First month up front as a deposit. I like the framing of that. You know, it's not prepaying for a month, it's just a deposit yeah. up front. <laughs> I like exactly. It. Yeah. I so so anyway, so I get him, I mean, they don't compete. So I get him to talk to a couple of my staffing clients in the U S mm-hmm. guess what magically happened when they were at 25% trade capital and 8% profit, all of a sudden trade capital comes down to 17 profit goes up to 15 gap is closed. And all of a sudden they become magically powerfully right. cash flow positive. So why does the profit increase as the trade capital a number reduces? Like what causes that when, relationship? When you you see it, it's they kind of get connected, but not in a direct one to one way. You start to see what's possible. So when you see that it is possible to be that profitable, you start questioning all of your decisions of your profit matrix. You know, am I am I not charging enough? You know, what what's you know in the you know what's my direct labor efficiency ratio? And that you know I'm you know in in the staffing world, I mean they're they're labor efficiency ratios are, are really low. You know, you're looking at kind of a buck 35 to a buck 50. And then the next thing you know, you start to say, well, if these guys are getting a dollar 55, why can't I get that? Mm-hmm. And you, so you start trying, you start questioning things because you see that somebody actually is doing it and it's, it's validated information. It's not just somebody talking about it in the public. You know, that it comes from a validated source of data. So then is it that, um, the one way to to improve the operations to scale smarter is through improving or reducing your trade capital through improved terms in terms of how you charge your clients and so on. But there must be the other part of your expenses. Like, you know, well, people spend so- on launch capital but they don't think it's launch capital. They just think it's operating. Yeah. Is that, is that the, I, I, I will tell the you, two I, levers? here's, here, two here's le- what yeah. I think, here's what yeah. I think causes that. Yes. So when you start to look at trade capital and then you say, okay, well, here's my overall trade capital. Now let's look at it. So this is another one of the chapters in the, in the new book I, from segment, segment P and L's. Mm-hmm. So when I take the company as a segment and I start looking at it as a line of business and see which lines of business that I'm doing has the best trade capital positions and then I look at it on a customer basis and say, which customers are abusing me on terms, mm. which generally are the least profitable customers. Mm. And I stop doing business with them because I can't get them there. All of a sudden I become more profitable because I figured out the picture of what is the type of work that we need to focus on. That's the most profitable and cash flow generating. And what is the type of customer that fits that pattern? And, you know, really, I mean, at the end of the day, all we do is pattern recognition. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, show me an industry, show me a line of business, show me a customer, show me a production unit of an employee or a unit of operation, 
and, and see who's the pattern. And now let, we've got a standard that we can validate and perform to, and it's not theory. It, it's, it's proof. And I think that's really typically what drives up profitability because I attacked it from another thing to see who are the bad actors. So, but there's a trend, like, so for the people that are listening, there would be um, the aha moment of going, oh, there's this way of doing it. And then there's like the getting the numbers in place. And so that you know, what is your trade capital um, percentage um, and your profitability percentage. But then there's the transition period of when you now having to make decisions on say for, uh, just taking your previous example, there's an unprofitable client, this is an unprofitable service line, but you can't just rip them out completely because yep. they probably support a part of the operation. Maybe it's not profitable. We, we, so we, always, we always tell investment. ourselves that. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so please, can you then maybe, yep. could you dispel this myth then, right? Because there's a thing where it's like, well, it's contributing to the overheads, for example, right? Not right. to profit, but to overheads. Well, th this right? is, yeah, I, one of the things that I kind of rail against is the contribution to overhead customer. Um, so that's why I'm loving this podcast because I know that you're going to dispel <laughs> every myth I'm, <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah, I, I hate that idea because okay. I'll give you a good example. One of my Please. clients right now is a the con concrete contractor. And so things got a little slow over the winter for us, which is December. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so they, they took some contracts at really low pricing to cover overhead and they didn't tell me about it until it came up on the next consulting call. And I go, um, I understand your thinking, but let's talk through this. I said, here's why that was a bad idea. Uh -huh. And I, I mean, I, I hate to tell you, I'd call you out, but I mean, it was a bad idea because mm -hmm. you would have been better off just covering those operating costs because we know that the good work was coming. Uh, it, it, it's a known. It, it wasn't a, it, we weren't hoping. We mm -hmm. knew that the, the, uh, the, the Department of Transportations that they generally deal with were going to be letting some better contracts. And, and it's like the company was well capitalized. It wasn't in any danger. Mm -hmm. and, and, no, and now, because we've taken on these low cost deals, it's getting in the way of now the, the full margin jobs that are available that we can't start because we're still working on this stuff mm. that we took to cover overhead. And I, I, I client to client to client that takes on those bad jobs, those are the blockers of the high value work. And you've got to put prioritization on getting those high margin things to the top of the list. But I, I get it. Once you make a commitment, you, you've got to flush out the, those bad words bad work and, and, and get those out of there. And I, the, I, it's not to say that you would never do it, but boy, I, yeah, I, I can't remember a time that I've, I, you know, when I sit down and work through the math with a client, unless they're just, I mean, if you're going to start taking on that work, you got to do some other cost mitigation to turn off cost in the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and if you're not willing to do that, then nah, you know, just don't do it. So it's better to take the harder path of reducing your overheads than take on additional low margin work because that will limit your scale potential. And then you'll get stuck in a period where the growth is flat potentially. Well, and, and you also teach people bad standards. Bad standards. You know, because, yeah, oh, I mean, we're seeing this with COVID right now. We, we, see, we see two diametrically opposed production uh, outputs from COVID. The companies that kept everybody on staff and had activity drop and they just said, you know, we had some government PPP funds that you guys may have heard about and all that, yeah. which was mm -hmm. great, you know, but, but all of a sudden with limited work, people settled into a slower work pace mm. and they're having a really hard time now that their, their backlog is there they can't get back up to the same speed that they were working at pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. right. Everybody who trimmed to what work they had, they're coming out like a rocket ship. I mean, they're, I mean, they're profitable. They're, and they've set new productivity standards with, I mean, really what we saw. And this was, I mean, because we got the 100 companies, we could look at this. There was about a 10% reduction in direct labor and about a 5% reduction in management labor mm -hmm. out, out of that billion of revenue. And, and essentially, it kind of goes back to what, you know, Jack Welch, the famous CEO of GE, you know, used to say is everybody's got 10% of your labor that really you ought to get rid of right now. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's a harsh statement. Unfortunately, it's probably true. Mm-hmm. And COVID forced the, the companies that really looked hard at it. Um, that's what they did. Mm-hmm. And they never looked back and never missed those people. Fortunately, they felt okay. Those people actually weren't harmed too bad because we've had extended unemployment benefits mm-hmm. that continue mm-hmm. today. That those people are probably doing better, you know, not working than they, uh, some of them did even working. Um, can we, can know, we, that's going to be a problem. Can we jump to, um, what you talked about, I think in your first book called Labor Efficiency, it's called LER, I think. Um, mm-hmm. and Correct. Can you just explain what that is? Because I want to just jump into that because this is where I get a bit confused between mm-hmm. trade capital and launch capital if you're staffing up for the future. But c- could we start with that? So what is yeah. this ratio? Yeah, so essentially, you know, the, one of the things I always felt like was bad psychology is looking at labor as a, as a fraction of something and, or as a cost. And so realistically, I mean, you, you, you guys tell me, but I, I don't see anything productive in the world happening without labor. Mm. And so until we, we're totally inundated with artificial intelligence, um, it, it, it takes humans <laughs> to make things happen of value. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in the first book, I used a simplistic measure, which is a, a good way for people to think about it. And it, and, and part of this was driven by my disdain of this, this calculation that I, I think I make a point uh, somewhere in my, either I did in an article, I, uh, I don't think I said it in the first book, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it said, never, ever, ever represent your company as revenue per employee. I mean, I, I, just, I just hate that, that discussion because one, revenue is the most flawed number on your P&L. None of us have the same revenue quality of a dollar of revenue. Now, once you take revenue minus cost of goods, gross margin a- across all those businesses is a comparable number, mm-hmm. but not labor. Everybody deploys labor at a different output rate. Mm-hmm. And I use this as a way to teach it is if I'm in a staffing business, I'm generally producing gross margin because I really don't have any cogs, you know, but I'm proof gross margin of about one and a half times what I'm paying that person. And what that means from it, it's, it's a measure of how much the, the marketplace respects the value of your labor. If you want to look at it in a harsh way of saying for every dollar that I'm spending on labor, the market's willing to give me 50 cents extra, which 10 cents of that 50 is for payroll taxes and minimum essential benefits and 40 cents is for me finding the person, getting them to show up, and replacing them if you don't like them. And that calculation is based on the gross margin or revenue? Gross, gross, gross margin. On the gross margin. Divided by gross wages of that person that, that you're, you're charging out. Mm. And so that is the low end of the, of the value scale. So I always use staffing as, a, as the low end. Mm-hmm. Generally... And this is a lot, I think the, the data point kind of is a little bit of what I call pricing bias, is if you do kind of the cost buildup equation, you're going to see a common data point of gross margin per labor dollar at the $2 level, because that's really kind of the cost recovery of a decent profit. And if, if you do what you say you're going to do, that's about where the number always comes out to. But if you're really good at billing for the value and, can, and having true, you know, IP value, uh, know-how, you know, those kind of things, then you can move upscale. So like our IT managed service clients, um, they're probably an overall labor efficiency county management and direct in, in that 220 range uh, to, to uh, maybe 220 to 250. But their direct labor, it, one of the things we do in the So for every $100,000 of salaries, they make 220000 back of right. gross margin, right? right? Pretty much. That's exactly. Calculation. Now, that yep. simplistic measure is that 100000 of salaries is a blend of everybody in the business. That was and my so, next question. So that's basically right. the full labor of the whole company, not just cost right. of sales. Is that right? Yeah, and, right. And so in the in kind of the advanced way of looking at it, we, we go into a whole chapter of kind of splitting it between direct labor and management labor. And so direct labor, it's still looking at that gross margin number. But because it's only direct labor, you get a much finer 
you know, analysis of how you make money. So in mm. the professional services world that I live in, mm -hmm. my direct labor efficiency ratio is going to be a two mm -hmm. in, in most of those businesses. Mm -hmm. And a landscaping business is going to be a four. Mm -hmm. And and here's here's the reason why those two things exist. In a in a professional services world, you're lightly managed. So I'm expected to be a professional and manage myself. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a much lower cost of, of management labor overseeing that, that professional labor mm -hmm. in a lower labor cost category that needs direction and guidance. I've got a much more expensive management structure to, to get that $4 of value. And what we see is it helps businesses as we go through these analyses and examples, we see businesses, you know, it like we get a lot of data points in the managed service provider world where we see, they should be a four direct LER and they should be a four management LER. And in that environment, we see a 250 direct labor efficiency company, but we see a seven on the management labor. Well, what that's telling you is I've got very inefficient direct labor because I don't, I didn't hire enough managers to make them productive. And I'm, I'm trying to run them almost more like a professional services. And so we get them to say, hey, you're, you're not giving your people enough guidance and coordination. You're leaving it too randomly up to their choice. And that's not the most efficient output, you know, business model. So you got to, you got to invest in management labor. The more about common support label. That, yeah. But what about support the, labor? Like, you know, for example, you know, accounting that's like yourself, like that, is that's, that, managed, we, we that's management. Yourself. Okay. That's all part of so, management. Secretarial, so I started, I, all that jazz. I started all. off calling it admin labor. Yes. And I got pushback of ma managers. You know, the, the management people got offended that I called them admin. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll just call the whole bucket management labor. <clears throat> okay. So it is anybody who's not direct is management labor. Got it. Okay. And, and so, so what you're trying to figure out is, you know, uh, what is the return yeah. on the management labor you know, just for that support, the managers, the support, uh, the administration to, right. to the total gross margin. Now, so in manage, the direct manage, to, the total, to, to the total gross margin. Direct right. is to gross margin. Yes. Management labor is to what we call contribution margin. So it's gross margin minus the direct labor. So we ah. move one more step down to hold management accountable to that number mm -hmm. in, in that process. Okay. And, and because ultimately, as a manager, you got three variables, your responsibility and that if you're not a direct labor person, your responsibility is to help increase revenue, minimize cost of goods sold waste and make labor efficient. I can affect that contribution margin from any of those three elements. And so typically what we see managers tend to be overly focused on one to the detriment of the other two. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted a measure that says, listen, I don't care how you get there. You can run all kinds of plays you want, mm -hmm. but just make a dollar drip out to, to justify your existence is, is what you have to look at. And, and that's and the so contribution margin that you're looking yeah. at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and we say that cost, you know, contribution margin to me is the most important number on the P&L. Uh, un, 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 hands down. Why? You know, that is that Why? production of a dollar of contribution margin because that's the pure horsepower of the business engine. So it's that the is the output. It's the revenue less the direct labor or is it revenue, less well, cost of sales? Yeah, cogs. Yeah, cost of okay. sales. Less cogs and then it's Minus direct labor. Yeah. Minus direct labor. But what if direct labor well, you, you, you have to take out the if cogs. You have to take out the, cogs first. Okay. Yeah, so, so cogs is just for the the product side of things, but if your your cogs, well, but you can you can labor, have because it's a professional services firm. It's the same See, thing then. Just because I have services doesn't mean I don't have cost of sales, or or you can call it cost of goods or cost of sales. Yeah, you know, it's an mm -hmm. interchangeable term. It, I, there are things that I choose to pass through. So here here's the thing that you got to look at today's businesses. Mm -hmm. We're we we have basically deconstructed business to say, focus on the one piece of a value chain that you really do well. Mm -hmm. So why is it that a general contractor is a general contractor? Why don't they do framing? Why don't they pour foundations? Well, no, they get a subcontractor to do it. Well, that subcontractor is a blend of two things, materials and labor. Mm -hmm. And, and, but there again, I am taking now that 
that subcontractor is a business unto themselves and they have to be profitable to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm choosing to do as a sub, as a general contractor is take the value chain of building a building and saying, I really just want to be paid for the coordination of all of the things that happen. And, and you're paying me for the value of what I do. And I mm -hmm. still make a profit off of my cost. Mm -hmm. And these other people, are being paid for the value of what they do and they'll make some profit, you know, too. Mm -hmm. And we've all kind of shared that, you know, in the overall value chain, mm -hmm. but it's not un unheard of that I could create a company that knows how to pour concrete and build, put framing and put roofs on and, and, and do carpet installation. And it, it's not that it can't be done, but the business community has said, well, you can't be really good at all those things. And so, Good example, I, I use this one all the time, is like if you're a manufacturer, well, you're a manufacturer. We, I got news for you. You're also a sales organization. Mm. So the question is, can you be world-class at manufacturing and sales? Probably not. Well, maybe I'm good at selling stuff and I need to do contract manufacturing. So why is it that we have stuff made in China and Latin America and, 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 or just by somebody else, even inside your own country, mm -hmm. because they can make it faster, better, cheaper than I can. I conceptually designed the product that I needed, but maybe I, I don't like doing that. I may be really good at making stuff and I suck at selling it. Well, <laughs> why? That's yeah. why distributors exist in the world. Yeah, sure. Exactly. And every company like in that value chain needs to be think to be thinking about this the same way. Yeah, like exactly. So here, here's a great framework that I use all the time in our consulting clients. And I learned this from one of my clients, a company called quickparts.com that I, I helped them get started. They had a great arc sold out in about yeah. 10 years and, um, and learned a lot from the CEO, Ron Hollis. And I got to be really good, good friends, but mm -hmm. Ron, you know, he, this company, they were the first ones to create an instant quote for a custom manufactured part. So if you were a product designer and had a CAD program to design the part, you would upload this output file from the CAD program and you get an instant binding quote for a, a prototype of this mouse mm -hmm. next day. Mm -hmm. You know, in, probably this was in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was, Quick Parts didn't, didn't own any equipment. They didn't make anything. What they did was, is they had a pricing algorithm that said there's a thousand or more data points out of that STL file, but there were only 14 that mattered for pricing, which is a very important point. And so they tested this algorithm of pricing. They hired a supplier that, that tested the algorithm and said, we will make any part that you quote under this pricing algorithm for 60% of whatever you quoted for. And so that establishes kind of a benchmark that we use frequently of saying in the value chain of, of a product or service, 60% of it is the value of doing it. But there's 40% that has three components to it. The marketing of it, the sales and closing of it, and the oversight of it. And so what Quick Parts built a business around was not owning a single stitch of, of prototype equipment they got 40% of everything they sold, but they had to deliver on, they had to market to the, to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of think of that 40%, 20% of it's the marketing value. 10% of it is getting to contract. 10% of it is the oversight and coordination with the customer to make sure that things flow smoothly and they get what they're looking for. You can add plus or minus 5% to each of those four components of marketing, sales, oversight, production. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's an incredible framework for the separation of an economic activity into, you could have four distinct businesses doing each of those elements. Mm -hmm. And, and many of the people doing business today are exactly that they are one of those four components. Mm -hmm. And then that's their business. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stay true to say, Am I getting the appropriate value? Am I being overcompensated for a temporary period of time and the market eventually wakes up and realize I'm an unnecessary component at that price? Mm -hmm. So, And those are large things. Yeah. And so, so does this apply across the different business models? 
you know, like there's oh yeah subscription, there's manufacturing, there's services, mm. there's like e-commerce, Absolutely. there's product, you know, like yeah. this approach, this thinking of trade capital, launch capital, um, mm. the labor efficiency rate. This is, this is the same across every type of business. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, so let me give you an example. So we had a client that's a Amazon reseller. Mm-hmm. And so they were doing about 55 million in revenue, losing about two and a half million at the time. And kind of, I, I was worried that I was going to be doing a, how to, how to wind down the business. <laughs> uh, but, but we got into it and, and they were selling 33,000 SKUs. I mean, they, they had a lot of product. Mm-hmm. And so we did a quartile analysis looking at these elements of I'm looking at margin by product and I'm looking at terms by product. And, and those terms, think of terms on a per product because they, they didn't, they, this company didn't have anything of their own. They were just reselling other people's stuff. And so with each one of their vendors, there was a, a, a speed of inventory turn as well as then what are the terms I get from, from mm. the supplier? You know, who, who makes me pay them in 30 days? Who mm. makes me pay up front? Mm-hmm. Who gives me 60 day terms? Mm-hmm. And so this is why trade capital matters because it is a net number. Mm-hmm. I, if, if somebody, if I got slow moving inventory, I don't care as long as I got longer terms. Yeah. If I have fast moving inventory, I can live with shorter terms, but it's the net of the terms. That's, that's the, that's what you were talking about earlier. Like it's on one side and then it's, right. then it's balanced on the other. And what you want to do is you want to slowly grow it so that, you right. have more trade, more profitability and, and, and less trade capital stuck. Yeah. Stuck and when I'm, when I'm interfacing, you know, customers and vendors all have different needs. And so I just have to look for where is my, op- if my opportunity is not on the customer side, then I have to go after the vendor side mm-hmm. and make that vendor a partner almost, you know, in that regard. But if I can convince them that I can triple or 10, 10 X their activity, if they'll work with me, I've got a more valid argument with them to give me some support. I'm not doing it just because I've got power over them. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it in this win-win, you know, approach, which is my favorite approach in business. Yeah. And, and yeah. And so when you can craft those decisions that way, you can get people to move off of a, a hard position. So anyway, we went through all 33,000 SKUs and we said, we came back and said, well, we got some good news. We got some bad news. <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the bad news is you need to stop selling 32,000 of the 33,000 SKUs. The good news is if you focus on just the thousand that are best, we can get you to, you're going to drop the 35 million in revenue, which at the end of the day, who cares, but you'll make 750 of profit. Mm. And that's exactly what they did. And, and so part of it was, is we, we found a couple of flaws in there. They had created some artificial intelligence on reordering quantities, which mm. you always got to be careful of validating when mm. you put some AI in place that right. we, we kind of found some of that issue, but yeah. essentially we helped them form an, an analysis framework of every vendor relationship, because when it comes to product, the key is speed of margin. So I don't, you know, I, mm. I, I need a, a minimum quantity of margin, but I also need it to move quickly through the equation. Mm. So when I was pre COVID, I, I did a speaking tour in, in the middle East and I was in um, doing several of the UAE uh, uh, areas and, and, you know, I was talking to them about their, their businesses and they said, well, you know, the government's really promoting uh, entrepreneurism, you know, but, uh, but the government was the key offender. I mean, these guys could be profitable, but they were having to wait 120 days if they did business with the government of getting paid. Uh-huh. And, and so actually, I think one of them, uh, I think Oman was going to actually have me come back and talk to their, their finance ministry to say, listen, if you want to spur entrepreneurism, I got a simple answer for you. Just be the be an exemplary payer. Pay faster. <laughs> pay faster. You pay can't, faster. You're going to pay it. You have the money. I, I you know, yeah. don't. <laughs> And, and, and I will tell you, I, I've come to this very harsh conclusion. If, if you want to be a third world economy, just slow down the payment of things. If you want to be a first world economy, just make margin flow fast through the wow. economy. That's cool. Because, you know, when I went to, to Kenya, there is no lack of demand in Kenya. It's just that it, it's just it's a dysfunction of, of terms of how fast ca- cash flows through the system. Sure. And and here's what happens when you have slow moving cash in a system or a marketplace, 
only the big boys can play because they've got capital. Mm. And see, this is what has opened up like the U.S. I mean, it, cash is not a problem. It, mm. Execution is our only problem of creating successful growing yeah. businesses in the yeah. U.S. Mm hmm. Now that mm -hmm. starts to separate the herd a good bit because yep. there's those who can't execute and, and those, and who, those can't. who can't. Yeah. 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 But it, so, it's a, it's a wide open, you know, race. And, and I think Australia, you know, from my clients that I talked to down there, I mean, I, I think you guys are, are pretty much kind of in that same mode. I, I don't, I don't see matter of fact, like I said, in the staffing business, you know, you, you know, my client there had better payment structures than, than our clients in the U S I think it's the same across every, um, country in the West is that, you know, there's a percentage that do, and there's a percentage that don't, the percentage that do well are, is, is the smaller percentage of the general kind of business. But see, community. here's my hope. I, I honestly think it's just, we just don't know how to talk about it. Mm. And, and, and this is as I've, you know, we've been operating under this philosophy that's in the 2.0 book, you know, for about four or five years now, and, but much more so in the last three, I would say, mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is, is we've seen more success of people transform their business into a high return on investment business yeah. where the 20 years previous it lacked. Yeah. And I think it's that's just, because of accounting discussions and this kind of complex calculations. And, you know, like yeah. straight after I did the Vern Harnish podcast, I purchased the book because he said, you could, you know, like to buy this book. And it just gave the words, it gave words on how to think about things. And it's from an accountant that said, don't worry about that accounting talk. These are the things <laughs> that you need to think about, which the accounting, um, the accounting industry just doesn't talk about, you know, across the board and they don't teach. And you've really put words to a concept that is really easy to understand. But like these two books, like they're yeah. fantastic. They're not long. But there's a lot of super simple, yep. some calculations in there, of course, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's just such it a good way math. to think about yeah. that. But I think it's given, or well, it gives, um, especially smaller businesses, concepts that they yeah. can start to apply, right? And it it helps people make harder decisions on the business side of things, you know. And so, yeah, um, it's it's such a it's such a fantastic book. And now I know why Vern Harnish is such a proponent of it because <laughs> well, it's the, the, the simple good news to is, grow if you know what to focus uh, on. Yeah. I, I, uh, um, I'll give you some inside baseball uh, knowledge here that uh, last month I went in the studio and finally recorded the audio version of the first book. Mm. So that actually will be coming out here yes. you know, probably in the next month or two. Yes. And then in a couple of weeks, I actually go back to record the second book. So we'll have both of them out in audio format. Which is you know, great well. because, because I love to listen to books and I couldn't find that I'm like searching for Grab, grab Tree on the Audible app. I'm like, it's not there. Damn it. I have to yeah. read it. It's coming. But, it's but coming. lucky enough, it was short enough um, that it was easy enough yeah. to read and also it's, scan it's to get to the parts which are maybe applicable for you. You know, I think, you know, this is highly recommended for anybody that is responsible for how the budget is spent within an organization. It's fantastic for entrepreneurs, but it's also fantastic for anybody that has to drive profitable growth. Um, because What's it been really fun simplifies is, it. Yeah. You know, the first book I would say is definitely that aimed at the 5 million and under business because I'm trying to break through some bad ideas, but we've actually found even 20 and $30 million businesses that found the things I talked about, you know, useful, um, the second book really to me, you know, is, is knows no beginning and end in terms of scale. Mm. We've actually found a lot of our much larger businesses, especially in the, the ones we do a lot of segment work with a lot of the bigger businesses, because yep. let's face it, if you're a $20 million business, you're, you're probably four or $5 million units. I mean, they may have different, yep. different values. Mm -hmm. we, we just did a, finished a project with a $20 million, you know, uh, HVAC, you know, client and, you know, and they did like, they had eight divisions and just totally blew them away. I mean, they have a really high level controller. I mean, they have really good data, but they had not, they didn't see the la the direct labor efficiency ratio was, was yep. the first thing that really jumped out at them by division because they, some of the things that they were scaling were the things that had the lowest <laughs> leverage of labor. 
Mm. And it's like, listen, guys, this isn't where the gold is. This division over here, this is the one that's got the bigger, better leverage factor to it. And then when we applied the cash flow terms to each of those, oh, man, when you start looking so one of the things when I'm doing segment accounting is I look at contribution margin dollar per trade capital dollar invested. Mm -hmm. And boy, you want to talk about an eye opener when you start to see here's the true operating cash flow that I generate from the trade capital invested. Mm -hmm. And here's the one that's, you know, so one, they had a parts division. (laughs) <laughs> they were basically paying for the parts division. I mean, it, it basically, I mean, it, it was just awful, you know, and, and, that's, and what, you know, yeah, but that's but what once you see the data, you, you start to ask yeah. different questions. And I think that the larger a company gets, the more um, one department subsidizes the other department. And like, that's where it gets harder to continue to get the double digit um, performance every year, yeah. because you don't know which part, is supporting the other part because it's all combined. It's all connected. But listen, yep. this has been such a good chat. Um, and I've been so happy to just uh, to completely unpack this this topic. Um, the book's yep, available sure. on Amazon. The book is coming soon to Audible. Um, yep. So are you taking on additional clients? And if so, sure, sure. how can people contact you? Yeah, the, you know, the best thing, uh, there's a contact page on the simplenumbers.me website that you can reach out. Uh, like I said, we, we have clients in Australia, so we, we work across, you know, all time zones. There's, there's a time zone that, that fits. So typically, uh, we've either done, you know, for us, either super early in the morning or, or late yeah. in the, the evening. We, we don't mind that. I mean, that Just like this fine. podcast right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can see the lights exactly. going up, so, and, <laughs> you know. This, this yeah, being turned yeah on. so so yeah. these are, you know, our, our, our staff. I mean, you know, it's really kind of cool that, you know, it, it's something that I, I, you know, whereas our firm really, you know, doesn't think about things, you know, globally, they're, they're focused, you know, um, you know, pretty much in the, the, from North Carolina to New Mexico kind of, you know, mm-hmm. kind of footprint, but, but ours is, you know, we still do what we do, you know, globally as well as some of the other units. And, and really to me, I've always looked at it as a way to challenge my thinking, to, to validate it and say, Hey, you know, you, you see different parts of the world operate slightly differently, but at the end of the day, entrepreneurism is entrepreneurism. And, mm. and I do plan, uh, I, I do have plans to get a book tour, you know, and, uh, go through, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, hopefully next year. So kind of targeting for March of, of 22 you know, that I can get down and, um, and, and, uh, and do a long awaited tour in the region. <laughs> You know, yeah, so that, that'll be fun. So I've, I've, been to, I've been to Sydney and Melbourne before, but uh, would love to get back and, uh, and, uh, and see the country coast to coast. For sure. I can't wait for travel again. I think all of us um, would like that. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, it's been Anytime. such a fantastic and, conversation, uh, Greg. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, good deal. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Growth Manifesto podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.